Welcome to the podcast. I'm Angela Bobier, and this is Life in the Talbot Settlement, brought to you by Turconno Heritage Society, operators of Bacchus Page House Museum. In this series, we will do our best to give you a full appreciation of the history of Western Elgin County in southwestern Ontario, from First Nations to the early settlers to the 1950s. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge funding from Turconno Heritage Society, operators of Bacchus Page House Museum. Welcome to the 26th episode of the Life in the Talbot Settlement podcast. Today we'll be talking about the production of textiles, including flax and linen, and wool processing, weaving, sewing, spinning, rug cooking and punch needles, felting, and quilting bees. The story behind the production of your polyester drapes has probably never crossed your mind. For our settlers, that was hardly the case. From the field, to the clothes on their backs, quilts they slept under, and rugs they walked on, the women of the 1800s were involved in every step of the way. There were two primary materials used, linen derived from flax or flannel primarily from sheep's wool. When the two fibers were combined, the fabric was donned with the whimsical title of Lindsay Woolsey. Let's start with flax. Since the upper Paleolithic era, flax has been used for textiles and it has been found across most temperate regions for the last 5,000 years approximately. Comparatively, in North America, flax was a successful but new crop introduced by colonists. The flax plants were manually pulled by the roots to harvest. This ensured the full length of the fibers maintained intact. They then underwent the process of rutting. The plants would be placed in rows and flipped weekly allowing for even sun and moisture exposure on all sides of the plant. This process produced an enzyme that broke down the stem and fiber bond, allowing the fibers to be separated. Retting took a full month or more, so efforts could be made to speed the process by laying bundles in a shallow pond. This, however, produced a strong odor and slimy texture that was undesirable. From here, the outer straw would be cracked in a flax break then scrutched to separate the brittle bark from the fibers. These fibers would be bunched and repeatedly run through hetchels, which are large combs with metal tines, to separate the fibers and pull out any short strands. If you stop at Bacchus Page House Museum and visit our agricultural center, we have some hetchels or flax combs that you can see. The short lower grade fibers called tow, could be made into rope or spun into coarse yarn for sacks. The prime product would be soft, long, and blonde in color, producing the likening of flax and hair for those people who've got blonder hair. This product, known as strick or line, would be spun and then woven into linen and used for bedsheets, table linens, undergarments, shirts, and summer dresses. There are records that Mary Story, who had the original land grant that Bacchus Page House Museum sits on, sold linen made from flax to Colonel Talbot and possibly some other people as well in the area. Now let's move on to wool. Almost all the farms would have had a flock of sheep. According to the 1842 agricultural census, the Pattersons on that census had the most significant wool production with 84 sheep and a total of 313 yards of cloth from 350 pounds of wool. They were the neighbors to the east of our Bacchus property. Now here on our property, during that same year of 1842, there were 16 sheep and 40 yards and 40 pounds produced with an increase to 40 sheep and 160 pounds of wool fleece by the 1861 census. The sheep would have been multi-purpose breeds, used for both meat and fleece production. Once raw wool was sheared from the sheep, it would be sorted, washed, then carded to remove any debris and align the fibers in a singular direction. The carded wool would be stacked in logs called bat, then stretched into continuous fluffy sausage known as roving. This would then be spun into yarn. There are two prominent methods of spinning used by the settlers, spinning wheels and drop spindles. The wheel was a faster way of production, winding and spinning the yarn onto a bobbin with the help of a continuous treadle powered flywheel. Drop spindles were easily portable, but comparatively slow. 
The yarns produced needed to be made into cloth, and this was achieved by crocheting, knitting, felting, or weaving. Now, weaving was performed using a loom, and in the upstairs of Bacchus Page House Museum, we have such a loom. We also have wool winders, spinning wheels, and carters that you can come and have a look at. Now, a loom would hold a series of longitudinal threads called the warp. These would be set close together at the desired width of the material in production. The lateral threads are known as the weft, meaning that which is woven in Old English. These are woven in an alternating over-under pattern between the warp at 90 degrees to create a plain weave cloth. Alternating colors and differences in the weave pattern would change the look of the weave, allowing for more complex designs. To color the cloth prior to 1850, natural sources were used including roots, flowers, fruits, insects, and minerals. To produce some basic colors, women would not have had to go far out of their way. Common kitchen scraps such as red cabbage and onion skins produce colors such as pink and yellow, respectively. Other pigments such as purple and dark green were rare, expensive, and difficult to produce, resulting in their position as royal colors and a symbol of the upper class. Mid-century aniline dyes were introduced. This process of chemically dyeing produced vibrant, color-fast pigments that were widely and affordably available by the end of the century. Woven cloth that used wool fiber would commonly undergo a felting process. This included agitation of the cloth in warm water to lightly mat the weave and weft together. When felted, the cloth could be cut without fear of fraying at the edges. This element was particularly useful when the fabric was cut to make clothing or other crafts such as rugs. Although the exact origin of the craft is unknown, rug hooking became knowingly popular at the end of the 18th century in the Maritimes and spread across Upper Canada during the 19th century as settlers developed their homes. It is considered a country craft, with manufactured carpets increasing in the cities mid-century but at a hefty price. Sewing scraps and retired clothing would be cut into strips, then pulled with a rug hook through linen or burlap backing to form short loops. The tension of the backing and surrounding loops created a secure mat of neat loops. An alternative method was using a punch needle, another traditional tool originating from the Maritimes for rug hooking. Regardless of the method, the final product was identical and practical in the household. The processing and production of all textiles was labor-intensive, and the women of the community made a social event of it, lightening the work through the community, the most notorious of which is the quilting bee. A bee is another word for a social gathering or party, and groups of women would gather and work together on multiple quilts. This sped up the quilting production and allowed valuable social time that otherwise could not be afforded and would be spent working alone. Following the advent of the Industrial Revolution, the mid-19th century saw the availability of sewing machines, which allowed for faster quilting and more complex designs that were previously only accessible to the upper classes. Why not schedule a tour at Bacchus Page House Museum by contacting us by phone 519-762-3072 or by email info at bacchuspagehouse.ca, where you can see our loom, carters, and all things textiles, including some actual textiles from the 1800s. We hope you will visit soon. For the settler women, there was always loom for more handicraft skills. Your abilities were a social currency as wheel as a practical tool. It's spoolish to not appreciate the beauty of every stitch and thread. The time and energy put into textiles made them worth their weight in wool. Please tune in next time to the Life in the Talbot Settlement podcast for episode 27, which is part three of A Grave Situation. Please share the podcast with your friends and follow us on all social media platforms at Bacchus Page House. The Bacchus Page House Museum and Turconnell Heritage Society acknowledges the land we are on today as the traditional territory of First Nations people. As settlers at a settler-focused museum, we value both the significant historical and contemporary contributions of all original peoples and ask how we can be supportive in Indigenous cultural renewal. Life in the Talbot Settlement is a production of Turconnell Heritage Society, operators of Bacchus Page House Museum. Your host has been Angela Bobier. Music provided by Jack Whitmer. 
and thanks to our producer, Caitlin Reitzma. To make a charitable donation, become a Turconnell Heritage Society member, and to contact the Bacchus Page House Museum, please visit our website, www.bacchuspagehouse.ca. Thank you again for listening. Thank you.